Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, feet, femurs and footprints, how dinosaurs got around. Plus, Dr. Esther Odakunle asks if dinosaurs could swim. Everybody's doing a brand new dance now. Could dinosaurs actually dance? Um, yeah, that's that's basically <laughs> how I'm starting the podcast off, Dave. You started it with the locomotion and then didn't say locomotion at the bit, which is the thing we're talking about that's kind of ruining the point of doing it. I like to imply <laughs> the uh, the subject matter rather than actually say it. I'm not, I'm, I'm subtle. I, <laughs> I assume that our listeners are great intellects and... and a familiar with cheesy pop exactly we're going to talk about dinosaur movements but not that sort of not uh, copra lights not that sort of movement the other sort of movement so whether they skied um whether they climbed whether they flapped whether they glid whether they walked whether they ran whether they stumbled whether they stubbed their toes ever yeah i wanted to talk about something i mean it sounds extremely basic of like you know did they walk and run and how did they walk and run but as ever, that's actually quite a complicated subject and there's a lot more going on than people would realise. Well, initially, you know, when they first dug about the ground, people did them squished with their legs poking out the sides. They assumed that they were lizards and therefore they would have moved with their bellies scraping along the ground. People absolutely did that and, and even more extreme versions than this. So, so modern reptiles in particular, lizards, we would say, are sprawling. So their legs do stick out sideways and if you see them walk they have a very distinctive movement the first dinosaurs were clearly reptiles of some description reptiles walked like this therefore dinosaurs walked like this um and it led to some particularly extraordinary ones uh, there's a reconstruction of i think it's diplodocus but certainly one of the early sauropods where they put it in this posture and realized of course that diplodocus has this massive barrel chested body and the only way it's going to get around is if there's massive hole in the ground for it to do so and this was the assumption and there, there's a there's a drawing or painting of of this of diplodocus moving around the landscape with this giant like three meter wide two meter deep ditch that it has ground out with its body and everywhere it went it left a trench so i mean could diplodocus have been trains <laughs> It's obviously very easy to be critical in hindsight, but um, if people had looked a bit more at the animals that they had around at the time, they might have spotted a solution because crocodiles, we, and I mean crocodiles, alligators, etc., um, we talk about as being kind of sprawling animals, but they're not. Um, they can leg it. Yeah, so they can run and gallop. Uh, and in particular, they do a thing called the high walk. Um, which you don't see very often in captivity, but I have seen it in zoos. Um, I've seen it on Florida golf courses. Oh, cool! You see them. You see them in these people taking photos. They go, "So it's a massive," and it's always perspective. But they do walk around really high. Yeah. So most of the time on land, these animals will have a pretty sprawling posture with their arms and and legs out sideways. But what they can do is pull their arms and legs right underneath the body and get the body properly clear of the ground in a way that um you know lizards can't and we now understand that the reason that crocodiles can do this is the ancestors of modern crocodiles were much more like dinosaurs and were fully upright with their legs under the body running around and the group well one of the groups that went back into the water that's then actually a problem because then your legs kind of are in the way and you want to be more streamlined. And so they kind of reduced that ability such that they could tuck their arms and legs in more effectively. So the modern crocodiles are a descendant of a group which could stand upright like dinosaurs and like modern birds and mammals and are kind of lost that ability. And when they're doing that high walk, what they're actually doing is putting a lot of muscular to a lot of muscular effort in to pulling their arms back under the body. So it's it's actually quite strenuous for them. And they do look proper snooty when they do do it. They, they do. But the point I'm making is that, you know, pe people, you know, obviously in the Victorian era were looking at lizards and going, oh, well, you know, dinosaurs must have walked like that because they're reptiles. And if they looked a bit harder, they realise there's another reptile group, most of which are much, much bigger, who can walk upright. So why wouldn't that at least be a possibility for dinosaurs? It was quickly realised, and I mean very quickly realised, that dinosaurs probably were upright animals you know the famous crystal palace reconstructions i guess they're very rhinoceros like and extremely chunky but they are not sprawling at all uh, and this is pretty obvious when you see the hips and their hips are actually surprisingly like ours in the sense that there's a nice big hole in the middle of the hips for the head of the thigh bone the femur to go into and the femur when you've got it 
is basically a giant inverted L shape so that it's got a very distinctive head at basically 90 degrees to the rest of the shaft so that that can plug into that hole in the hip and then the leg sticks straight down and not sideways. And that was realized very early on. And so these immediately became upright standing and walking and potentially running animals that's pretty sweet so um we've discussed on the podcast before about how we we've got this amazing thing called a bottom and the bottom yes. lets us stride it lets us squat it lets us do all of this unique movement no dinosaur reconstructions i've seen have given them nice booties <laughs> I, I think yes. I actually have seen dinosaurs in booties where they've got little shoes on. However, that's not what we're talking about. That's different. They don't have they don't have glutes in the same way that we do. No, we don't. Um, though, of course, actually, you know, few animals do, uh, or at least not true, in, in, in quite in quite the way that we yeah. do. Um, but yeah, so so like all other reptiles, what dinosaurs? Well, I was going to say snakes aren't really doing this, obviously, for different <laughs> things. Like, like other legged reptiles, there are some leg muscles that attach onto various bits of the pelvis and will help move the legs backwards and forwards. But what's really doing it is, I'm sure we've mentioned these before, but this thing called the chordo femoralis. So these massive muscles that attach from the corda, which is the tail, to the femora, so the chordo femoralis. Uh, um, and so it's a huge block of muscle that attaches on the tail to the back of the femur. And the femur is the upper thigh bone. It's your thigh bone, isn't it? Just yeah. Just, yeah. just pe- making it clear, because some of us, you know, we know the leg bone attaches, but it's leg bone. To the knee bone, and the knee bone attaches to the shin bone, yeah. The big long one, you don't want to snap. <laughs> yeah, Ow. yeah, don't do that. So, yeah, so all muscles can do is contract. So when they contract, they get shorter. Um, and what that does, therefore, is then pull that femur back. But if the, if the foot is in contact with the ground and you pull the leg back, that will push the animal forwards. So the big drive for walking are these chordofemoralis muscles. And they're absolutely enormous. I mean, they can reach happily a third or even halfway down the tail, even in really big things like sauropods, which means you're talking about a block of muscle that can be you know six seven eight meters long which is really quite a big block that's like four of me yeah (laughs) that's ridiculous (laughs) and so when that contracts that's going to have really quite a lot of power to it but then you're shifting a really big animal is that why you get the tail swish when they're moving would you get a tail swish am i thinking that right because it'd be pulling on one side of the tail yeah, so you're gonna you are gonna get a bit of that as a result. Um, there's probably some more complicated things going on with sta- tail stabilization in places because every time you get movement of bits that are not you, as it were, that's kind of wasted energy. So animals are usually trying to minimise this. But yes, you're probably going to get a wave propagating down the tail as a result of this. I've actually got a paper in review at the moment, which in part talks about tail stabilization. And hopefully it may even be out by the time this podcast comes out, which goes, I'll be desperately attaching a link to it. <laughs> yeah, so, so that, that's the big thing of like kind of how they're moving. And of course, for the bipedal animals, so basically all your theropods and quite a chunk of the ornithischians and some of the early sauropodomorphs, that's the majority of their locomotion because they're walking just off their hind legs. So their arms aren't really doing anything. For the quadrupeds, the amount that their arms do varies enormously. So even among some of the really big sauropods, they clearly have massive legs and actually, I wouldn't not weedy arms because obviously there's an awful lot of animal there and an awful lot of weight and they need some drive, but they simply don't have the attachment points for similar kind of muscles. Their shoulders, so their shoulder blades in particular, the scapulae, they are attached to the body, but they're not fused to this giant block of bone in the way that the pelvis is, which makes things kind of more awkward for exactly that kind of point of drive. You know, there's the risk of things moving around. It's easier to tear stuff if you put too much strain on it so in most things the legs are either doing all the drive if you're a biped or actually most of the drive even if you're a quadruped is that true of like modern mammals as well like bison and cows and things it's rather more even on us i think at least in part because we have much smaller pelvis so i think even even things like elephants actually only have three or four vertebrae so bits of the backbone incorporated into the pelvis so the pelvis itself whilst a huge you know there's a lot of bone there but you compare that to like a comparable sized small sauropod or an ankylosaur or a ceratopsian they'll have seven eight nine ten vertebrae attached to the pelvis so the pelvis is a much bigger block of bone which is much better held together 
so they can put a lot more power through it. That suggests to me that they could accelerate very quickly. Because if, if they've got this like massive great engine, I'm thinking of cars where you have like all the weight and stuff on the back and then they could just vroom, accelerate really quickly. There's long been an idea that things like the hadrosaurs and the iguanodonts, so the, the duckbill dinosaurs, the iguanodontians, basically were walking around on all fours when they were slow and as they accelerated up to top speed would be running just on their back legs. And there's a couple of reasons to think that. So there are a bunch of lizards that do this. And as they accelerate, they actually go up onto their back legs. I, I've seen that they're hilarious. Hadrosaurs are actually a really good example of where they have really quite weedy forelimbs. They are not particularly big and they are not particularly powerful. And iguanodons need to keep their like thumb claws clean. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> don't think the orientation was likely a problem for them uh, okay. um, but whether, whether or not they did that I, I don't know um, I, th I think there's been some real pushback on that in recent years but certainly the idea you can see where it came from and it I don't think it's a bad idea as such and there's some there's some other animals that do something similar so wallabies and kangaroos when they walk around slowly, they actually have a form of locomotion which is called pentapedal. Um, now, of course, they don't have five legs, they have a tail. Yeah. Um, but what you'll see they do is they very obviously put their front legs down, which in this, again, same context, really quite small and not that strong. They'll put their front legs down and their tail down and then lift their back legs up and swing forwards. And, th and so they'll move as like a tripod and then a biped alternately. And then, of course, as soon as they start accelerating, they'll go on to just their back legs. Um, and kangaroo rats and, you know, hopping mice and various other things do exactly the same thing. So there are a, quite a diversity of animals which will shift their locomotion from four legs to two, depending on quite what the situation is. So it's certainly not unreasonable. It's a really bizarre thing because I know they're doing it to save energy, but I've hopped around on my back legs in that motion and it is really hard work. They've got, they must have all of this sort of like springy muscle or something to just absorb the impact kangaroos and i assume kangaroo rats but i, I and gerboas and gerbils and other things but ca kangaroos certainly have been studied and they are very unusual in that the faster they go the more efficient they are for exactly that reason they are extraordinarily springy and so when they are moving quickly they have more momentum which means when they land from a jump they are compressing those tendons and things which will give them some spring and then of course as they jump off again they get that spring return but if they're not moving very fast they can't compress them much and so they don't get much return and so they're actually more efficient moving at like 40 50 miles an hour than they are at like 10 15 miles an hour which is a really good way of traveling long distances fast and efficiently so yeah kangaroos are extraordinary they were really getting off the subject of dinosaurs oh yeah but i was just thinking you know hadrosaurs they might have we found any with really big feet that's no <laughs> um and, and but but actually going back people did suggest that some of them jumped i think in conan Doyle's lost world there's a description of uh, the megalosaur or allosaur bounding like a kangaroo um and that's certainly been reconstructed and suggested as such for a number of them i think off the fact that they had massive hind legs and a really big muscular tail but they're really not set up to to bounce <laughs> unfortunately shame, it? wouldn't it be lovely if somebody discovered that t-rex bounced that would be the most amazing because it's got the little it's got the little arms it's got the little so you, yes you want, and they had a and, a and a big head oh it would be a reasonable understanding if you had, you know, a little herd of hadrosaurs and you had a T-Rex sneaking up and one of them was on guard and spotted, they would all run, but they'd all run and they'd all stand up and then skedaddle. Yeah, the idea is, is as basically as they accelerate, um, they, they kind of lift up and they're in a similar position to some of those lizards in the sense that if you look at the centre of mass, so in other words, if you average the entire animal and see where is that... It's a, I was going to say physical point, but I mean physical in the sense of physics. It's a calculated point. Where does that sit in the animal? And in things like hadrosaurs, and indeed a lot of things, including a lot of the big sauropods, it's either at or just in front of the pelvis. So in other words, all, you know, the center of all of the weight is over the back legs. It is not somewhere in the middle of the animal. Now that's true of almost all things to a degree, because the lungs are at the front and actually that's a surprisingly big cavity with you know very little mass at the front but 
for you know big quadrupeds you know like elephants and rhinos and buffalo and stuff like that that center of mass is going to be quite a long way in front of the pelvis it'll be closer to the hind legs than the front because of the lungs um but the absence of the tail is obviously going to make a big difference compared you know you've got weedy little tails compared to dinosaurs um and so yeah you, with things like the hadrosaurs you know that center of mass is right over the hind legs so you can see how you you know you can pivot the body around that axis effectively without stumbling or tripping or falling over because you're not reliant on your hands being on the ground to avoid falling forwards. And now I'm thinking if you had and like feathers, you could use it to sort of take off almost. It would be you could actually have the extra lift helping you. But that might be a bit. <laughs> well, that's sort of been suggested. So one of the kind of ideas for the origins of flight is if you look at things like ostriches. You know, they are flightless, but when they run, they will open out those big wings and use them to help them turn. And the idea that if you're a Microraptorine or Anchiornis or something very close to birds, but you can't yet fly. But if you're running along quickly and you stick your arms out and you get some lift, you effectively weigh less which is a quite a good way of running faster. And if you then flap them a bit, you would weigh even less. And if you flap one over the other, you could turn very, very quickly. Um, I don't think anyone really buys that now as an argument, but there is a kind of point there that, yes, if you if you ran quickly and held your arms out, it's, it's probably going to help. The difference then between walking and running, if you're a hadrosaur, is four legs versus two. Potentially, <laughs> Potentially, and because the gait changes when you run on other animals. Um, I mean, could they trot? Is basically what I want to know. Could they do the trot thing? <laughs> so my my gait analysis is a little out of date. I know, but the one the one I learned when I was doing biomechanics as an undergraduate is that the the definition of running is a fully suspended aerial phase, okay. which basically means all of your limbs are off the ground at the same time. There are more modern and better definitions of that. So by that by that argument. Tyrannosaurus, for example, or at least adult Tyrannosaurus, because juveniles are probably quite a bit different, could not run. They probably had one foot permanently on the ground because they're just too big and heavy and you don't want seven tons of animal falling a distance, which is then giving you even more momentum onto a foot Um, and a foot that's actually not particularly big. They were probably permanently speed walking rather than running mincing along power walking beautiful and obviously bigger and heavier things and most obviously the the sauropods but also you know big ceratopsians and stuff like this and chylosaurs they're never going to run in that sense where they get all four limbs off the ground they could probably do something pretty close to it ceratopsians maybe they could and get into what we'd call a gallop for a for a quadruped Again, I'm seven, eight ton triceratops. I'm struggling to think that they could genuinely do that. But it's at least a possibility. It, it is different when you're a quadruped. It's terrifying. Imagine one of those things barreling at you. Well, right. And so, you know, bigger things tend not to be able to move quite as quickly, in part because they can't do this. Though what you can often lose in kind of raw power in that sense, you make up in size. So T-Rex is a good example of this, where it may not have been able to run, which we think of as being a faster gait than walking, but it's really big, which means it's got really long legs, which means that each stride actually carries it really quite a long way. Um, And so, you know, speed walking is not necessarily slow if you're taking enough strides and those strides long enough, because that's ultimately what is the two factors which are moving you at a speed is how often you are taking a stride, so your stride frequency, and how long those strides are, which is your stride length. So between those two determines almost everything. So you're saying that if there were two dinosaurs having a fight and you needed to get a T-Rex involved, so you went to the enclosure with a flare and then you ran away from the T-Rex in order to get them to fight the other dinosaurs, you might not make it. Yeah, so... You'd probably get nailed, um, <laughs> is, the, is the really short version, particularly if you tried to do it in high heels on a wet, cobbled street in the dark. That'd be silly, wouldn't it? <laughs> but but there's, there's, there's a more general point there, which is working out how fast dinosaurs could move is really, really hard because there are so many unknown factors and the errors just balloon out of control very, very quickly. It's relatively easy to say how quick they were relative to each other, particularly if they're 
fairly similar builds um, because you can work out the stride length and you've got an idea of how big and heavy they are and how much muscle they've devoted to their legs, which will give you a fairly good idea of their stride length and probably how powerful they are and which give you at least a guesswork of stride frequency. And it's fairly easy to look at small light things with really long legs and go, they're probably faster than the big chunky things. Um, but people are obsessed by having a speed. They always want to know, could it could it exceed X speed or could they, you know, what, what was the speed that they could reach? And the, the answer usually is either we don't know or we've got a whole bunch of analyses and they give you this enormously <laughs> wide range of answers, none of which are very informative when the fastest speed is five times the, <laughs> the estimate of the slowest speed it's somewhere in there. If you had a look at a like lion skeleton versus a cheetah skeleton, would you know how much faster a cheetah could run and for how much longer than a lion? It's, there's not that much difference. Yeah, che- cheetahs are very obviously high speed adapted, but that doesn't tell you quite how fast they'd get. And yeah, you're right, it gives you no idea of their endurance. Because so, so cheetahs are unusual as mammals in that they're actually got a fairly hefty component of white muscle. Cutting a lot of corners and generalizing a lot. There's there's red muscle and white muscle, and red is good for endurance and white is good for speed. And mammals are usually an awful lot of red muscle. And cheetahs are very weird in that they're an awful lot of white muscle, which of course exaggerates their speed even faster because it means they can take extra strides quickly, but it means they get knackered super fast. And you just can't tell that from the skeleton or in the case of dinosaurs from the fossil record. Let's look at stride lengths because I just want to know how big the biggest stride was. I mean, I mean these big sauropods were they taking lots of little steps or were they like taking massive giant all stretched out ones could we tell um yeah but mostly because we've got footprints for things um which of course is a really nice entirely independent line of evidence from finding skeletons the problem with footprints is it's often very hard to say what animals they directly attach to so I've mentioned before, I, one of the reasons that T-Rex is useful from a research point of view is it's pretty much the only big carnivore in its ecosystem. And actually, even the large tyrannosaurs, there might be a bunch of species, but they're usually pretty close relatives. So when you find really big tr- theropod tracks from a tyrannosaur-dominated environment, you may be able to go, oh, I'm not quite sure which of these two or three species it is, but they're all really similar to each other. And therefore, you can go, right, I can take this, that this is almost certainly a tyrannosaur track, Um, I can measure the length of the foot and I can go and compare that to skeletons and go, okay, it's a foot of about this length, which means it's an animal of about this size, which probably weighs about this much and its legs are this long. Right. So I can measure all these footprints and I can measure this skeleton and I can try and line everything up and see what's going on. And yeah, you can do that for quite a few things fairly reliably. And that actually lines up with the predictions that you'd make. So there's a um, famous biomechanics researcher called Neil Alexander, who died ooh, probably about eight or nine years ago, I want to say now. But um, he was he did some amazing stuff. In the end, and in the 60s, 70s and 80s was doing stuff like this. He was measuring dinosaur footprints, calculating the length of the foot from that, getting an estimate of the hip height and the stride length and then calculating speed. So all all very basic first principle stuff. You know, a leg of length X tends to have a foot of length Y, which will tend to step at speed Z. But from that was calculating a whole bunch of speeds for various animals. And some of them had some fairly big errors on them in hindsight, but a lot of them as basic calculations have held up against much more complicated methods based on reconstructing individual bits of muscle and weight distributions and lung locations and balance. And and it's, yeah, you get a number right, roughly what he already said (laughs) 30 years ago. Well, it's nice because it shows you that I mean, that, that kind of validation is brilliant, actually, because it means you can go and do the quick and dirty method and know that your answer is probably quite reliable. Doing super complicated things to find out that the easy thing is right is extremely useful because it means the easy thing is reliable and you don't need to worry about it. It's not very sexy for publishing. Quick and dirty with lots of information is much more better for getting your papers published, surely, than going back and checking. No, because journals like super sexy, overly complicated methods, <laughs> even if they just produce the result that we cool. already good on, knew. Good on dinosaur <laughs> journals, that's what I say. Um, I mean, doesn't it make a difference between, like, because if you're looking at a set of footprints, obviously you're thinking, oh, that's going to be in slippery mud. That they're leaving them. So it's a bit of a, you know... So footprints are a... I was going to say footprints are a minefield, which is <laughs> possibly mixed metaphors, but actually might be quite a good one in this context. Often footprints are being laid down in stuff that is relatively soft. Not necessarily, which is a good start. 
we prefer looking at the ones which look like they're very good. And some are extraordinarily high fidelity. Like you can see the individual scales on the underside of the foot what? in the impression. Were they yeah. looking at the moon? What? <laughs> No, it's you know, it's just it's a really nice fine mud that probably wasn't too deep and so the foot went in, lifted up. If it was a nice sunny day that dried very very quickly and then some more mud washed in and just preserved it. And so yeah, you have some trackways where you can see the individual pads, so just like the pads we have on the on our fingers. Um though they're they're more asymmetric. So ours, you know, if you look at the palm of your hand, you basically have one bulge for each bit of your finger and the joints are in between. Mm. That's not how pads work on the feet of a lot of reptiles and birds. So the pads wouldn't line up with those joints very accurately. But anyway, the point is you can see those individual pads, you can see the scales, you can see the tips of the claws where they've touched into the ground. So obviously ones like that are absolutely brilliant. Some end up in stodgy mud and then they're all a bit squidged and you can't see very much. Uh, And then some are deep mud and have extraordinarily complicated patterns going on. Um, So, you know, anyone who's walked across you know, somewhere like Western Supermare when you've gone out into, <laughs> into the mud. Um, if anybody's left a welly behind, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. You can see where you have walked. There is a trail of footprints, but none of them look like footprints at all no. because the mud has sucked back in. Um, and so one thing you get in particular is there's a whole bunch of, you know, like crow's feet like footprints, you know, almost like three lines meeting together and then a long line at the back for dinosaurs uh, which have been a puzzle and uncertain for a long time a lot of people interpreted those as swimming tracks with just the toes scraping along the surface there are genuine swimming tracks but these are not they and there's been some wonderful work in particular done by a guy called uh, Pete Falkingham who's up at uh, now Liverpool John Moores where they got the whole block so it's not just the little print that you can see on the surface but that has gone deep into mud and so what's happened is if you can imagine the foot has pushed down through the mud and then lifted up and forwards as you take the next step and then all the muds collapse back in but that has dried as a block and by either cutting that block up physically or with some kind of you know penetrating scanner you can reconstruct the entire 3d nature of that and work out what the track and the trace of each individual toe has been and then pete and his colleagues have done some wonderful stuff doing this with like laser scans and like live video x-ray of guinea fowl and other birds walking through tiny glass beads and then tracking where every single bead moves around the foot as if it's a mud particle oh my goodness. and yeah, you can. it turns out you can basically backtrack dinosaur prints with a remarkable fidelity and see how they were moving through deep mud, which is really, really cool. Unfortunately, it's really awful for working out footprint size and shape. And another one which is even worse is you get a phenomenon known as underprinting. Underprinting? So, yeah. So if you can imagine lots and lots and lots of layers of mud or sand or whatever the sediments are, because that's often how things are laid out. You don't, don't have just 10 metre thick of soil. There are lots of different layers and you walk across that as a big heavy thing your weight and the pressure of you stepping down is going to dissipate and it will push out in all directions and so the top layer might leave a really nice crystal clear footprint but the one below it is going to be a little bit bigger and you know pushed out in every direction and a little bit less clear and then again and then again and then again and then again and then that can all fossilize and years later the upper layers can wear away and then all you're left with are the underprints and they're often a very indistinct and b absolutely sodding massive because they're not a real footprint they're the dissipation wave of the effort of a footprint there was one so there were sauropod tracks that came up in france i want to say about five years ago now but a while ago not not too long ago not too recent and they were described as the biggest footprints in history and they reconstructed this dinosaur that was off the scale size because they had sauropod footprints that were like a meter and a half two meters across Mm -hmm. for an individual foot So, of course, they scaled this thing to the size of the Empire State Building, kind of. And it's like, no, that's obviously an undertrack. And that's the weight of a heavy sauropod on soft sand. It's blown out and blown out and blown out. And you're looking at two meters below the original footprint. 
And so now you've got a track that, you know, the four feet just touch each other at this point because it's not a real footprint. Um, and that's one that happens all the time. And under tracks can still contain real information because you can just measure from the tip of the toe to the tip of the toe. And that will probably still give you a reasonable length of stride length and stuff. But particularly when people find indistinct tracks and start reconstructing giant animals off them, they are almost inevitably under tracks and then everything goes horribly, horribly wrong. So kids, watch out for giant footprints in the news. They're not what they say they are. So is there anything, I mean, is there anything that we can learn from footprints that isn't, I suppose, just the distance between them or, you know, the way they put down their feet? I mean, what what it, what did they really tell us? It can tell you things. There's, there's stuff which we can't can't easily work out from skeletons that tracks can be a bit of a giveaway. So a famous one for this is the arm posture or four limb posture of ceratopsians. So as we said, you know that they're they're a good example of an animal with great big legs and then relatively small front front legs. And various reconstructions had the arms as kind of sprawling or nearly sprawling in them. And there was this kind of ongoing argument about whether or not, yeah, the, the, the forelimbs sprawled out sideways a bit like reptiles or whether the elbows pointed backwards. Do you know what this reminds me of, this sprawling thing? is is about how you do your push-ups. So you either do them to focus on your chest, yeah. so you have your elbows out, or you have your elbows in. So elbows out is sprawling, and elbows in, so then yeah. touching the side is more... You know, yeah. four-legged, I suppose. Yeah, though, though with sprawling, those arms would be pushed out sideways as well. You wouldn't have them under your shoulders. They'd be outside of your shoulders. But that's yeah, how ex- some people do their press-ups, you know. They, that's sort of- oh boy, that's a lot of effort. Yeah, because, yeah, you're not built to do that. So, so that was a discussion in the literature is quite how are they holding their arms? And that has important implications where the muscles go and how much drive you get from the forelimbs and yada, yada, yada. And that was basically solved with footprints because we found a bunch of footprints which were verifiable as belonging to ceratopsians and nothing else and the little handprints were exactly in line with the hind legs so they're not sprawled out sideways they can't be otherwise they wouldn't be leaving those tracks they could do what my cat does which puts her paws together when she sits down and then walks like an ape the rest of the time yeah (laughs) sprays yeah i don't think cats are a good model they're liquids aren't they they're not really yeah yeah That's, that's the first problem. Um, so things like that, I mean, a related one to the old tail dragging kind of trope oh, of dinosaurs, so going back to them being reptile-like, there are actually a few tail drag marks. They do exist, but they're extremely rare for the obvious reason that the vast majority of the time the tail is held well clear of the ground. So that's another example of where trackways kind of show posture and locomotory style. And then a final one, which is a little bit different, but particularly cool. There's a resting trace of a small theropod. Well, medium sized, um, small in the grand scheme of theropods, medium sized in that it would give you or I run for money in a, in a fight from, uh, I think it's New Mexico, I want to say, but it, it, North, North America, um, where this animal basically sat down. Okay. And so you don't just have, you don't just have the feet. You've got a bum print. Pretty oh much, my actually. Goodness. And, <laughs> and hand prints. So you've, you've got the, you've got the feet, but you've also got the kind of flat of the foot. So we walk on the flat of the foot. They walk on their toes, but they've got the toes and then the flat of the foot. So they've put the whole foot down effectively. Then there's a pair of hand prints which show that the hands are stuck in front of them and they were resting on those. And they're these nice pair of little kind of C-shapes because I think as we discussed in another one, uh, yeah, in the birds one, you know, dinosaurs don't flap their wrists over like rabbits or like they're playing basketballs, but they hold them with their fingers pointing inwards. And so this is exactly what you'd expect. They're rest on the on the equivalent of our little fingers. So they're almost, they're, they're doing like, they're resting on their forearms, the whole of their forearms yeah, up to their yeah. little fingers. Nice. And then finally, in between the feet, there's a big square block. Oh. <laughs> and that's that's the pubis. So if you remember from the theropods, they have, they have the their bones come down at the front and fuse together to the the pubes, and that sticks out below between the legs to about the level of the knees. So if they're squatting down on the ground, that's going to hit the ground, and it does. And we can see that. So we can see when they squat down and rest and sit as if they're just having a little bit of a rest. They flatten the feet, the pubis comes down and actually physically rests on the ground, and they will put their hands on the ground as well. Oh, wow. And so that tells you absolutely exactly how they are 
sitting. Did it also like put its chin down? So you got a little chin indent a bit further up, or did it have its head up? It's not impossible. Uh, I think it's not preserved. So unfortunately, it's one of those prints where I haven't seen the original, but I've seen some nice photos, and there's a really good description of it uh, in the scientific literature. Um, it's preserved easily well enough that all those features I've just said you can see. It's not preserved well enough that you can make out super fine details. And I don't think the area is that big. I'm sure they looked for this, and I can't remember what the paper says, obviously, in, off the top of my head, but I'm sure if there was any indication that the head had come Aww. down, that would have been included. It's just having a little rest. Well, do, I mean, I, no information about the tail either in this little resting situation. No, I don't think so, actually. But again, that's not impossible yeah. that it would, because the base of the tail would still, you know, there's a lot of muscle there. It could well be just the tip is touching or just the last bit is touching. And then if the ground is relatively solid, it might be touching. But if there's not enough weight pushing down, it's not going to yeah. leave anything. So maybe it didn't touch the ground. Maybe it touched the ground and didn't make a mark. Maybe it touched the ground and made a mark, but nothing preserved. Maybe it was a very special dinosaur, which obviously, if you think about it, had its tail looping up and over and its head arching right back and it was doing <laughs> yoga. So it's a big O yes. shaped. It was a display. He's looking at me really sceptically. I don't think this is... I, don't think this is I was right. going to say, you should be used to this expression by now. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes up at least once an episode where Izzy has an idea. <laughs> so aside from looking at the skeletons themselves and looking at footprints, I'm imagining there must be a load of paleontologists with like special toy dinosaurs all working out how to make them move. Oh, he's showing me one of his toy dinosaurs right now. But no, seriously, do, <laughs> do people spend a lot of time just working out, you know, building models and computers and stuff and just watching them move? Um, to a degree, yeah. I'm not sure they spend that much time on it, but there, it is definitely a, a growing field because obviously you can do stuff with models that you can't do with skeletons and that you can't do with footprints. And obviously, ideally, everything actually comes together and is kind of independently or pseudo independently verifies each other. Um, and yeah, like, you know, you can now walk into a museum and with a handheld laser scanner or even just a digital camera, take photos of a skeleton and drop that into a computer and the computer will peel out the bones. And now you've got a complete articulated 3D skeleton for you, which is a hell of a good That's start. Um, and one other, one other thing that we can get from bones really effectively, actually, for a lot of the big and more important muscle groups is where those muscles actually sit. There are physically, they're called muscle scars, and they are physically scars on the bones where muscles attach because they have great big ligaments on them, um, which leave these very distinctive roughened patches, often with a little rim around the edge where those muscles go. So you can look at alligators and lizards and birds and see what kind of muscles they have where and where they attach. Then you can look at dinosaurs and do a comparison and try and work them out. The size and shape and position of those muscle scars will give you something of an indication of how big those individual muscle groups are and therefore how strong they are. So if you've got a skeleton and you've got a fairly good idea of how much it weighs as a living animal, because we can reconstruct that and things like center of mass and the lungs and yada, yada, yada. And then you know where all the different muscle groups go and how big they are. You can give that information to the computer and basically say, make this thing walk or make this thing stand up. Wow and see what it does. Because strangely enough, animals tend to do things that are the most efficient and least effort way for basic movements like that. Um, you can see at what point, you know, they start. if they start trying to run, do they overbalance or does the weight fall in the wrong place or the muscles aren't strong enough to move the leg faster than this so they can't go faster than that. So try and do a ceratops rearing up and having it fall backwards on itself. Yeah, so that's probably going to be a tough one with the weight of the head and the fact that they are really well balanced above the pelvis, you'd have to really lift them up to do that. And that's probably not a problem very often. But yeah, you, it, you know, this is a way of getting a model to tell you what you think it could do based on that parameter. And if you find, for example, that that closely aligns with calculated speed from the leg length and from the spacing between footprints, then you've really got quite a nice set of, you know, mutually supporting evidence that these are how fast they could run and calculate things like acceleration and turning. And so we've got really quite a good idea of this. The problem that we have, which we have a lot of the time, unfortunately, is that this has been done rigorously for a couple of animals. Yeah. So we can tell you a huge amount about the acceleration and turning and top speed and other things of T-Rex 
and very little about anything else that it might have been running after <laughs> or might have been trying to get away. What about Velociraptor? Because it's called Velociraptor. Was that fu- as fast? Yeah, so that, that's a good example of something where we haven't an- analysed it in great detail, but first principles means it looks pretty good. So we talked about stride length and stride frequency. So obviously the longer leg you have, the longer your stride length is going to be, particularly if you're a relatively small animal. You know, greyhounds have really really long legs and they're not that big they're going to go quick almost immediately because of that greyhound versus pug you know you're going your money's on the greyhound not the pug yeah right but even even for an animal of kind of similar height you know greyhounds are really quite lanky animals if you had say a german shepherd or a labrador your greyhound immediately has proportionally longer legs with a you know and for a lighter animal as well And the second thing is stride frequency. So you want to move those legs quickly. And so one thing you see on a lot of speed merchants is that the femur, and at the front, the humerus as well, but we'll stick to the femur for now, is relatively short, which sounds counterintuitive when you're trying to make the leg move quickly. But if you think of the femur as the kind of start of a lever you know and it's 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 basically a lever moving through about 90 degrees that that's all it's doing and then that the, it's dragging the rest of the leg with it so if you make that short you it's actually move it's moving through the same arc in terms of degrees but it's moving a shorter distance and so if it's moving a shorter distance, you can make it move faster, which means you'll have more strides. So what you often see for the really fast animals is that the femur gets shorter as the leg gets longer. And that means they've got a longer stride and they've got more of them. And if you go and look at a horse skeleton, a horse femur is not that much bigger than a human's, despite the fact that horses are massively bigger than us and have hugely longer legs than us. And that's because they're taking a lot of strides and those strides are long and you put those two together and yeah horses are really quick i always get obsessed in the gym because like you, you're next to somebody short and you're both doing squats and they're doing them much faster than you ever can because they're diddy they've just yeah, got they haven't got the distance exactly. to move through. it's just not fair but but that, that that's a classic example of convergent evolution where pretty much anything that is trying to move very fast will go for a long leg for its size and a short femur and so as soon as you start seeing those characteristics showing up you know that these animals are moving quick does a long femur mean it's more likely to want to be jumping or something a long one because you get more muscle on the leg then yeah it will it will do various different things and i'm not qualified to talk about that in too much (laughs) detail um but but you know and as ever you've got all kinds of compromises going on so you know we've bred horses in particular to be really quick so that's going to manipulate those kinds of things and exactly that you know we've done the same thing with greyhounds in the real world there is always a trade-off between having uh, endurance and having top speed because you know cheetahs fall exactly into this trap they are extraordinarily quick but if they don't catch something in the first 10 seconds they ain't catching it because they've run out of puff before the animal and even if they have caught it if a lion or a leopard or a hyena shows up they just sit there panting and can't actually do anything and either get killed themselves or have to wander off and they haven't eaten so even as a predator that's a problem and as a prey species of course it's a particular problem you know if you can imagine small antelope in africa they have cheetah running after them that are happily doing 50 miles an hour the problem is they also have things like hunting dog and hyena running after them who will do 15 to 20 miles an hour for an hour so you yourself you know i was gonna say as if you get to pick you know natural selection yada 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 you know you can't be too quick because then you'll have no endurance when the other predator turns up and you can't focus too much on endurance or you'll never escape cheetah that's why you get them all twisty turny and able to change direction really quick yeah that's part of it but you know it it means that life is a compromise and you know if you live in an environment that changes regularly for example maybe it's very seasonal and so every six months you need to pack up and move 50 miles to somewhere else well then selection is going to favor both very high speed sprints for when you're catching prey but actually long distance efficiency if you have to migrate every year two or three times every year so there's all these other trade-offs that we can't necessarily pick up but if you to go back to your question attempt to answer it if you just take velociraptor as a as an animal it is very lightly built and has pretty long hind legs 
it's going to be pretty quick. It doesn't look like a super sprinter, but at the same time, it's going to be one of the faster things out there. And actually, that, that's a quite nice point in that, so calculations of T-Rex speed go up and down all the time, and at the moment, they're relatively low. And people are like, mm, it's not very quick. It's like, well, it doesn't have to be if the things it's chasing aren't very quick. And doubly so if it's more of an endurance runner, which T-Rex certainly was. Um, you just have to keep up enough that whatever you're after is still in your eye line and wait for it to tire out. So th- do they run like birds then? Are they running like an, an ostrich or are they running more like we do? And is there a difference? Because I seem to remember ostriches' knees go a weird way. Yeah, so so everyone says that birds have their knees backwards. Uh, that's, a, that's a really common trope is that birds have backward knees. But are their knees their ankles? Right. So if you, you know, there are basically... You know, three three main joints. You've got your hip, you've got your knee, you've got your ankle. What you actually see in birds. So when we stand upright, and if a dinosaur stood as upright as it could, kind of on tiptoes, you know, your your femur, your thigh bone is pointing virtually down. For the dinosaur, they point a bit forwards, but more down than than forwards. And then your tibia, so your shin and your lower leg is pointing slightly back. And then the ankle and the foot is pointing more or less forwards. And with those guys, they're kind of on tiptoe. So they've got an extra joint between the base of the toes and the rest of the foot. What, And that, that's kind of their normal standing posture. What birds have is their femur points almost entirely forwards. It's like at 90 degrees. It's, it, it's parallel to the ground, not perpendicular to it. So it's pointing straight towards the head. The kind of reason for that is they've got rid of the tail. So they don't have these giant tail muscles anymore to pull the femur back and move the leg back. So instead, what they've ended up doing is they kind of point their femur forwards and then it's the muscles from the femur to the lower leg, which are doing an awful lot of the pulling. But because birds are fluffy and feathery, can't see you can't see the femur. It's completely hidden under the feathers. So what you're actually seeing is the first bit of leg that comes down, apparently from the chicken or the ostrich or anything else you see. Flamingo is a really good example of this. The joint points backwards because it's not the knee, it's the ankle. And then they've got an enormously long set of foot bones, which to our head looks like a lower leg bone because that's the longest bit of our legs. And then they have their toes. Um, and so that's what's going on. Is we that you do see that in a lot of other animals. Admittedly, you, like cats and dogs, you see their femur, you know, because obviously they got fur, yeah. you can see it. But to be fair, that long foot, they only ever walk on their, their toes at their back. Their, their pad isn't their, is their heels up by where their knee should be. Yeah, and that's it, because we're really rather odd. So we, we are what is called plantigrade. We walk on the whole foot and the toes. Most animals are digitigrade. They walk on the digits, so they're just walking on the toes and fingers. Even elephants Cats, do that. Cats, dogs, birds, dinosaurs. Elephants are a slightly weird one because they've got this giant fat pad under the th- toes. But yes, they're more or less digitigrade. And then you have something called unguligrade, which is walking on tiptoe. So like a ballerina on point. And that's horses. And that, again, is a way of exaggerating the leg length is that they're now walking. The toe is now adding to the length of the leg because they're walking. They're running just on the tips. That's what hooves are. They're fingernails, aren't they? Yeah, that's that's exactly what they are. So horses and all the ungulates, so deer and antelope and giraffe and pigs and cows and things are, are walking, yeah, on, basically on tiptoe to exaggerate the leg length and make them just a little bit faster. But that that's what birds are doing. So they're, they're basically running off the femur rather than running off the tail. So that's called knee-driven running because it's the knee effectively producing it. And so, yeah, from that perspective, at least, dinosaurs definitely didn't move like birds because birds have got rid of the tail and they've shifted the orientation of large chunks of the leg muscles to get around that fact. And there are some stumpy-tailed dinosaurs, but they still have tails, bony tails, considerably longer than that of birds and still have a bunch of tail muscle attached to them. Uh, so they're not doing so they're that. they're not backwards And dinosaurs And dinosaurs wouldn't have had them at 90 degrees. They'd have had them lower down because they've got the tail to use the... Yeah. yeah, kind of 25 degrees from vertical kind of no. thing. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we know exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I like, you know, the way a lot of animals would stand like that, you know, the, the knee would point a bit forwards and then the lower leg would point a bit back. And the ankle. And then the ankle forwards again. Yeah. Flamingos are really good. For, uh, they're occasionally, I've got a really nice photo on my blog somewhere of flamingos sitting down the way we would sit down. And of course, their foot bones or the way we would stand 
And of course, their foot bones are by far the longest bit of the leg. So there's this bit of the flamingo, which is nearly as long as its body on the ground. And that's just its foot. That's its a little toes at the front. And then this great big long foot bone. If you under- put flamingos in shoes, they'd be clown shoes. Yeah, they're absolutely extraordinary. And they look so alien like that. And yet, no, that's exactly what we do. It's just that they've, they've, they've put that bit down. Quite a few birds will sit like that occasionally. Uh, and that's exactly what that theropod resting trace is showing. Mm. You've got the metatarsals basically flat against the ground. And quite a few big things do it. I've seen marabou storks do that uh, and cranes and various other really big birds. It's presumably a useful way of sitting, at least occasionally. But they obviously don't have their arms out like that because they're, they're, they've got wings. They kind of put them back and they're flat back. Yeah, cause, so, so they're, they're all kind of folded back. But also their posture is a bit different because the head and the neck are more upright and the head's obviously a lot smaller, so there's a lot less weight forwards um and other things go- and then they wouldn't have the tail for counterbalance which is part of the reason the head and neck are up so high so yeah they're not going to need to do that so that is a load of birds sitting so why don't you sit back like a flamingo uh because we've got a guest on it is dr esther odakunle and uh she is here to ask dave a question or two um so sorry speaking on um just like the different temperatures and just kind of thinking on the different temperatures across the world so what was the kind of distribution of dinosaurs across the world were they found in like every single continent or were they yeah. in, where there was just nothing <laughs> Pre- pretty much so you've got to remember that the the distribution of rocks which allows us to find dinosaurs is very uneven and so there are big tracts of the world with no dinosaurs at all or big tracts of the world with huge numbers of dinosaurs but from a very specific time however on average there is no reason to think that dinosaurs did not have a truly global distribution for the entirety of the period that they were around we find them on every continent including antarctica we found them now in something like 150 countries And there's only something like 240, 220 countries in the world. And many of them are very, very small. Um, You know, there are an awful lot of Luxembourgs and Belgium and (laughs) Monaco and, you know, all these little principalities. And yet, even so, we still found dinosaurs in over 150 countries Um, and including places with very, very limited fossils. So Japan and uh, New Zealand, for example, are both mostly volcanic rock which is not what you want for getting fossils and yet we have found dinosaurs in new zealand and in in japan um so they they really do turn up absolutely everywhere in antarctica and then northern canada southern argentina all over africa all over asia china india both sides of russia all of europe um uh, there's stuff in Denmark, I think. Uh, there's definitely stuff in the UK, so relatively northern. There's good stuff in Spain and Italy. So, as a, as a geographer as well, I want to also say that obviously the world didn't look like that. So, like if you're looking at the Jurassic period, you have like Gondwana, which is like South America and Australia and Antarctica, all of this sort of like massive lump with North America still slightly above it, and Eurasia sort of curling. So it's it's all yeah. a bit yeah. It's it was a, it was a lot easier to get around. Then as well, yeah, yeah. Which, is, which yeah. is another relevant thing, you know. Now, now, if there's something in Europe, um, you know, and then to get to South America, if you don't swim very, very, very well, you know, you need to go all the way across to Asia, hop across to Alaska, and then go all the way down through North to, to South America, and that's mm-hmm. a hell of a trek. It's nice. um, and yeah, a hundred million years ago, that was a lot easier. Two hundred million years ago, that was almost trivial. You go straight from you go straight from England to North America, and then even South America is quite a lot closer and up further. <laughs> yeah, it's, simpler times. Yeah, Indeed, doing, I mean, doing... you could you could just walk from Chile yeah. to um, Kenya quite easily. Oh. It's all the same land. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in, and then in over the, to Sydney, the... you know. In in the late Triassic, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, by the end of the Cretaceous, so by the time the dinosaurs died out, the continents were not far away from where they are now. You know, India had reconnected. Madagascar was still separate. North and South America were roughly in their current positions. Australia was separate. Antarctica was well separate. So really pretty close. And yet even so, we see groups that pop up in South America that then pop up in Western Asia. And it's like, 
well, they probably went through North America to get there or vice versa. And so we're, we're still clearly getting around. Um, and the, the swap between, again, it would have been easy. You know, it is not that far across the Bering Strait from Alaska to Eastern Russia and China. But we see entire lineages basically hopping backwards and forwards repeatedly over about 50 million years between that junction. So, yeah, things absolutely got around. OK, this might be a really silly question, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it might not be people you know, we've had lots of people on and people have gone this sounds really stupid but and you go actually that's a really interesting question that well, people avoid asking because they think it's stupid yeah. so let's, wait let's until you've asked it and then we'll let you know <laughs> okay um <clears throat> potentially silly question um <laughs> could any dinosaurs swim oh that's yeah, a so great that's a, question so no. oh my yeah God. <laughs> no, it, no, it's a it's a really good question. So there's been some fantastic research done on this. So the first thing to say is almost everything could probably swim in the sense that if you dropped them in water, they would thrash around and <laughs> propel themselves in the direction in which they intended, because there are very, very, very few animals that can't swim. Um, giraffe appear to be one of them and pigs if they're overweight. And after that, the list is very slim indeed. <laughs> Um, I'm because, sorry, I'm imagining well, like because, an overweight pig. <laughs> oh, well, uh, uh, so apparently things like Vietnamese pot-bellied pigs because they're really, really fat, and so the, the little legs basically just yeah. can't get any traction in the water, and so they, oh. but they still float. Yeah. So you got to remember that you know, unless animals are specifically adapted for diving, so things like hippos and things like whales. Um, you are less dense than water, so you float. You have a big space for your lungs, so if you docked in water, you will hang around on the surface. There's a very good reason to think that any dinosaur, if dropped in water, would fundamentally be able to propel itself and move around a bit and wouldn't just go glug and, and sink. Yeah. Um, Secondly, we've then got trackways, which appear to show this, with feet putting footprints in water. And we know it's underwater because of some of the way the rocks are laid down and you can see ripple marks and stuff. And those footprints get shallower and shallower and shallower and then disappear and then start coming back again and get deeper and deeper and deeper in, a, in what is interpreted as a river channel. And it is very hard to imagine that that is anything other than an animal wading out to the point that it floats swimming a bit until its feet start contacting the bottom and then it walks out the other side so that's really cool um then we've got stuff done there's a paleontologist called don, don henderson who works in the royal tyrrell museum in alberta who's really really clever with 3d modeling and very complicated engineering equations and maths that i don't begin to understand and don has built some lovely accurate 3d models of dinosaurs and calculated in different bone densities and volumes for the lungs and where those lungs sit in the body and shown basically how they float so not only do they float or not and the answer inevitably is they all float because of their lungs but actually are they do they float one way up or the other way up you know are they stable will they tend to roll over or tip or dip in various ways um and that actually in some cases matches footprints so for some of the big sauropods we get footprints in water which are just the four feet and don's model suggests that actually they're slightly front heavy so they tip and so if they were free floating in water the arms would hit the bottom before the legs and that matches what the footprints show so that's really good confirmationary evidence um and then finally, there's a couple of dinosaurs which appear to be fairly well adapted to be aquatic. So there's one called Halskoraptor, which was named just a couple of years ago um, from Mongolia. And that's a little dinosaur that's pretty close to birds, which is kind of swan or grebe or even loon-like. It's got a big, long, flexible neck um, and really quite weird l arms and legs. Um, which make it look like a pretty good swimmer. Um, the other the other one is Spinosaurus, which there's been a lot of stuff recently suggesting that it's a very good swimmer. I don't think it was anything like as good a swimmer as has been suggested. Oh, oh and... I saw a comment on Reddit about it. So Spinosaurus is one of these ones with the big fan on the tail. It's got like a little... So it's, so it's got, yes, yeah, so it's got a big sail on its back, which is the thing most people know. Some people were asking if that meant it could use it like a sail. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, uh, st sticking sticking a six foot high bony plate on your back is not a good analog for sailing ships. <laughs>
Now, now, Esther, there is an example of a silly question. <laughs> um, um, but yes, yeah, Spinosaurus does also appear to have a something of a paddle-like tail, which was just discovered in, or at least just published in the last few months. Um, though again, I don't think it's as strong a swimmer as has been suggested. I know I'm not the only one. Lots of people have said that. They're obviously waiting for the... Science takes time and there, there's lots more to come on that. I also need to do a note for people who are going, hang on, hang on, hang on, and just point out that ichthyosaurs and lizards are not dinosaurs am i correct in that um well they they are they are reptiles that are not dinosaurs so the literal translation of ichthyosaur is fish lizard um cool. but yes the so that that's a that's a classic misconception is that basically every big reptile from the mesozoic is a dinosaur and so pterosaurs are not dinosaur and nor are plesiosaurs pliosaurs ichthyosaurs Mesosaurs, Mosasaurs, Thalassosuchians, and many, many, many other reptile groups are not dinosaurs. But that includes l- about 12 different lineages of reptiles that were swimming at that time, none of which are dinosaurs. Um, so Hauskaraptor is probably the best candidate for a dinosaur that's a very good swimmer. Until, ironically, actually you get to the birds. So there are birds hanging around in the Cretaceous with dinosaurs, which were really good swimmers. In fact, they were flightless. Um, so there's a thing called Hesperornis or Hes- Hesperornis. Um, and yeah, it was it was a grebe-like swimmer. So it, it paddled kind of with its legs sideways, um, you know, kind of doing this very odd alternate legged breaststroke action. Literally like but, one of those toy ducks that you pull along behind you. Yeah. Yes, nice. Spot on, spot on. But massively reduced arms. So even it's, more it's a, like one of those toy ducks. Yeah, it's, it's a, so it's a it's a it's a flightless swimming dinosaur. So actually the best aquatic dinosaur from the age of dinosaurs is an early flightless bird, which to me only adds to kind of the puzzle. Because, you know, there's been this idea, which I, I understand where people have gone, well, the reason the dinosaurs didn't go back into the water is there's all these other marine reptiles that are kind of filling those niches. There's loads and loads of competition um, ecologically, and so they, they probably couldn't do it, except literally another dinosaur did it. It just happened to be a bird. So it's very odd in some ways that other dinosaurs weren't going in for this. Um, but yes, dinosaurs could swim. Most of them probably couldn't swim well at all. And there were pretty much none which were well adapted swimmers. You don't have whale equivalents, manatee equivalents, otters or so many other beavers. You know, we have loads of mammals that have gone back to the water. The dinosaurs, as far as we can tell, mostly didn't. Mm. Sorry, speaking of wells, um, what is the largest or what was the largest dinosaur that we potentially that we know of? Um, um, can you give me like a scale? So- yeah, roughly. So there's there's half. A, I won't bother rattling off names because there's half a dozen different species which all of which have a credible claim to be the largest ever. Mm-hmm. And obviously there's lots of fighting between paleontologists for each of theirs to be the largest ever. The problem with all of them, of course, is they're massively incomplete. And so there's enough that we can do some scaling and compare them to other species and have a pretty good idea of how big they are, which is why we know they're all about the same size. Um, but in, in you know, you look at the world now and blue whales are clearly bigger than any other whale. Um, African elephants, though there's probably two species of African elephants now, are clearly bigger than anything else. With the dinosaurs, there's a whole bunch that are about the same. Um, and their estimates vary enormously because you're scaling up and there's all kinds of unknowns when you start making animals this big and they're very incomplete. But I would say at least 70 metric tons is a reasonable weight for any of these animals. Makes feel good which about is bathroom scales, doesn't it? Ludicrous. <laughs> you know, a big elephant is five tons so yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know and and even even kind of the upper lower estimates so the lower estimates which bring those numbers down considerably Mm -hmm. the higher medium end of them is still around 50 tons or so so i i don't think anyone thinks that the dinosaurs the biggest dinosaurs didn't reach 50 tons so Um, how big were the like baby dinosaurs then (laughs) Well, that, that's the fun thing. Tiny, because you can't make giant eggs and they're not giving birth to live young. So, yeah, if you had a 70, you know, a 70 ton elephant would be giving birth to a 10 or 15 ton baby. Aww. But dinosaurs can't do that. So even a 70 ton dinosaur is still laying an egg that's football sized 
maybe a bit bigger that's five, six, seven kilos. So wow. tiny. Yeah. <laughs> but they grow quick. Yeah, and but even then That's for, a long, for a long time, you know, to, you know, you're effectively going from potentially seven kilos to seventy tons. That's wild. So that's a ten thousand fold increase. That's wild. Exactly. I mean, the amount of food they must have had to have eaten. So, um, Esther, did Dave answer your question satisfactorily? He did. Hooray! Great job, thank you. There we go. That's all we wanted. Wait, Excellent. hold on, hold on. Oh, One more question. <laughs> I am still recording. Speed so, yeah. up. I'm still recording too. Let's go. Okay. So, random, but did dinosaurs see in colour? Uh, yes, and they're actually tetrachromatic. So they've got a UV sensitive cell, which we don't. So they could actually see better colours than we could. Oh my God, wow. Which is normal. So b- b- birds, most reptiles, and even a whole bunch of fish do this. How do we know that? Uh, How do we even know that? Well, so again, we we don't know. It's it's a classic. We don't know that as a hundred percent surety, but basically, all birds do that, and all reptiles do that, and I think almost all amphibians do that. So be weird mammals if they are very much the deviation from this pattern. There is no reason to think that dinosaurs did not do this. Mm. And the reason and the reason mammals have deviated so much is because we almost certainly went through a fully nocturnal phase where what you're more interested in is black and white sensitivity and you don't really care about colour. And so they lost the colour vision. And then it was later required only in reacquired only in primates and only the diurnal primates. So early, so lots of lemurs, um, lots of galagos, bush babies, things like this, which are still nocturnal, still don't have that. Um, and it's only the diurnal primates who are around in broad daylight with bright colours and in particular tend to do things like eat fruit, where suddenly distinguishing colours and in particular reds is mm. quite important. Yeah. And so there's a reason that it's the monkeys and apes that have this, but they probably reacquired this relatively recently and UV isn't really important for us. Um, and so, yeah, we we just don't have it. But there's no reason, therefore, to think that dinosaurs didn't, because it's probably very useful for them, and indeed all their relatives before and after have it. Wow, thank you. <laughs> so a big thank you to Dr. Esther. You can find her on Twitter at e s t o d e k. I'm disappointed that all of the dinosaurs in the sea weren't dinosaurs. They were all reptiles. So there's no big swimming. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's it's that. It is that kind of classic. Any every ancient reptile is a dinosaur thing, which I've seen extended at times to things like mammoths and trilobites. <laughs> and it's like it's 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 you know, you, you sort of get it when it's ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and pterosaurs and go, okay, they're big reptiles and they were around at the same time as the dinosaurs from the age of dinosaurs. I I get where that mistake is being made. But yeah, once you're into kind of four hundred million year old marine invertebrates <laughs> or 200,000 year old mammals it's like do you know what dinosaurs are at all no, don't, but that's just why they come and listen to us because we tell them things if you do have any questions don't forget you can um join our patreon and ask us direct questions on patreon we're going to have a questions episode at the end of the series like we do every series as in this is our second one and we start right. the yeah, I was gonna say, so why not like, like why the other we one. do all of our series because they'll, um, the they'll continue um and obviously do do get in touch and whatever you can find us you, i say all this at the end in a month much better voice so listen out for that you do your radio I do four, radio voice. four mm. voice i do it i do it properly because that's not how i sound though so it's a bit it feels a bit fraudulent it's, it's always slightly weird because it's you but not quite you i think if you were doing it on someone else's podcast no one would have an idea but it'd it, be fine it'd be absolutely fine. it's obvious that you've just put this voice on to do that bit and sound a bit better voice. i can do my phone voice i'm very professional very professional anyway here we are <laughs> thank you thanking you from the poshest dinosaur Roar goodbye. A roar. Roar. <laughs> you went all oh, pirate. Roar, darling. <laughs> I know. Roar. <laughs> I'll do fine. Yeah, you're going to leave that one in, aren't you? Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. For bonus episodes and extra content, please visit our Patreon page. You can also purchase a mug, t shirt, or a Terrible Lizard face mask from Redbubble. 
go to terriblelizards.co.uk for links. Send us your questions. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook and Twitter. Include the hashtag terriblelizards. We hope to bring you more and more, but we can only do that if we get enough listeners. So please like, share, leave a review and subscribe.